let's talk about some more features of quantum mechanics using Dirac notation. So going back to 3D vectors, remember we could set a uh, set of three basis st states, and then we can write a vector in terms of three these three basis states. Uh, and since we have three basis states, uh, we would say that this is a three-dimensional vector space. The three being the number of basis states that we have, independent basis states. In quantum mechanics, instead of basis states, we have stationary states that we use typically to describe our system. So it's a set of psi n, where n is, say, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then we write an arbitrary state, capital psi. Uh, we can write that in terms of the stationary states, the sum over n, cn, psi n. But notice that there is an infinite number of stationary states in general. And so we would say that this is an infinite, dim infinite dimensional vector space. In fact, we give a name to that. We call that a Hilbert space. Uh, that sounds kind of scary. It sounds like a new idea. But recall, uh, this is really just Fourier series in some sense. Um, and so a Fourier series that you've probably seen before is, in fact, a Hilbert space, an infinite dimensional vector space. Let's remind ourselves how operators work in quantum mechanics. Uh, so for example, think about H hat, the Hamiltonian. So recall that an operator acts on some state, which you can think of as a vector, and returns another state or another vector. So in particular, H hat operating on a stationary state psi n gives E n psi n. And the right hand side is yet another state, just multiplied by some number. Uh, let's also remind ourselves about inner products. So we can take the inner product between two states. If they're stationary states, then we get delta mn. But I could take the inner product between any two states, and I'll get some kind of number, in general a complex number. OK. In addition to the inner product, we can do something called an outer product. So an outer product would mean I would write two states, psi and chi, and this way is how I would multiply them. What in the world is this? So in order to investigate what this object is, uh, let's have this act on another state, uh, say beta, and see what happens. So let's take this outer product of psi and chi and act it on beta. Well, if I write that out, I have psi, and then this turns into an inner product between chi and beta. But the inner product is just a number, and psi is just a state or a vector. And so what I get back is just another state or another vector. So I took something, uh, operated on a state, and got back another state. Well, that's what operators do. Operators turn states into other states. And so the outer product, this weird object that we had up above, is really just an operator. in disguise. I want to talk about one particular outer product that's very useful, and this is called the projection operator. I'll put that in quotations here. So the projection operator, I'll call it p hat sub n, is I take, say, some stationary states here, and I take the outer product between the stationary states. So let me act this projection operator on a general state psi. Uh, and so if I write psi as the sum over m, c sub m, uh, psi sub m, and so then my projection operator, I write out my projection operator, and that should be a psi m. So then uh, this inner product here gives me a delta mn. So I have a sum over m. These should be m's. That should be an m down there. Uh, and so then I do my sum. My sum picks out one term, which is the cn term, psi n. So I had a projection operator acting on psi, and it gave me back just cn, psi n. So it just gave me out the psi n component of psi. So this, in some sense, projects out the psi n component of a general state, capital psi. That's what the projection operator is. It's uh, useful and will show up occasionally. Uh, a related idea 
is that of completeness. Uh, and so let me construct this following operator, sum over n, and then the outer product of psi n, psi n, which is just a projection operator. Uh, and let me see what happens when I act this operator on a general state psi again. And so let me write that general state psi as a sum over cn psi n. Well, if I take this operator here and operate it on capital psi, uh, so now let me write out uh, or uh, pass through capital psi into the sum here. And so I have an inner product between psi n and capital psi. But that inner product just gives me the coefficient cn. And so then I have sum over n, cn, psi n. Oh, but that is just what I mean by the state psi. So I operated on my state, and I got back the same state. So this is a really special operator in particular. If I take the sum over the outer product of psi n, psi n, I get back uh, identity. And so I call this the identity operator, the one operator. Um, I just get back the original state that I started with. This statement here is called completeness, uh, and you could write it as the sum over the projection operators, um, over all of the projection operators uh, for your stationary states. Finally, I want to talk about the statistical interpretation in quantum mechanics and the statistical interpretation of these expansions that we keep writing. So consider a state capital Psi and some observable represented by an operator Q hat. This observable Q hat has eigenstates that are associated with it, chi n, and those eigenstates have corresponding eigenvalues, Q n, um, by the way, these eigenvalues are sometimes called the spectrum of Qn, or excuse me, of Q. Uh, in particular, if I operate Q on chi n, I get back, of course, the eigenvalue times chi n. So that's what I mean by eigenstates and eigenvalues here. Uh, I can write capital Psi in, as a sum over these eigenstates with some coefficients C sub n. Call it this c sub n, you can interpret it roughly as how much chi sub n is in the state capital Psi. That's one way to think about this coefficient c sub n. We're going to make that more precise. Uh, in particular, the interpretation is that if we measure q hat on the state capital Psi, uh, you will get one of the eigenvalues of q hat, which it could be q n, and you'll get that with a probability absolute value of c n squared. So you get one of those values when you take a measurement. You get one of those eigenvalues to q n. There is a corollary to this, which is collapse, namely after you make that measurement of q hat, then the state collapses. In particular, it collapses to the corresponding eigenstate of the eigenvalue that you measured. So if you started with capital Psi, and then you make a measurement, so then you measure Q hat, you will end up with a new state after this, chi n. That's the idea behind statistical interpretation and what happens with collapse.